All right, and we're live. Um, welcome everyone to PTTV episode seven. Today we are talking about cycling, treating cyclists, and we're joined by some of the industry's top experts. Um, to get started here, I'm just going to have them all introduce themselves so you know who we're talking to. Um, Eric, if you could start. Sure. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Eric Moen. I'm uh, from a town uh, called Kenmore, which is just north of Seattle in Washington State. Uh, I have a practice, uh, corporate sino physical therapy, and an education program called BikePT.com. Uh, I've been in practice for 20 years and have been treating cyclists for, for that time as well. Uh, my practice at this point is, uh, for the majority, bicyclists in the greater Seattle area, and people uh, come and see us from uh, region and, and national, uh, national base. Uh, we do some uh, I, I do uh, continuing education programs for healthcare providers and physical therapists with regards to treating the cyclists, biomechanical interventions, bike fit, uh, how to take care of injuries effectively. Great. Jerry? Uh, so my name is Jerry Durham. I have San Francisco Sport and Spine Physical Therapy in the Bay Area. Actually seated next to my mentor here, uh, Mr. Eric Moen whom I took my first ever Con Ed course and my first ever cycling course from. So, And he said he has the continuing ed. We just had him down in San Francisco for his first out-of-state continuing education uh, with the bike fit. Bike PT? Bike fit PT, Eric. What bike is it? Bike PT. Bike PT, thank you, sorry. And I uh, had a uh, group down there, so I was excited to have that. I probably started working with cyclists after I became involved in cycling probably about 10 years ago. I've been a physical therapist for 20 years. And um, at this point in time, to be honest, my all I do is work to grow the business and work with other cyclists. So I get to choose, fortunately, to work just with the cyclists these days. Very nice. Uh, Kevin? Hi there, my name is uh, Kevin Schmidt. Um, I own a, and operate a clinic called Pedal PT here in, based in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I'm primarily orthopedic, manual therapy based. Um, I started getting into cycling uh, when I moved to Portland in about 2002 and I've been pretty much a daily bike commuter every day uh, since then. And um, I indeed, just like Jerry, uh, hooked up with Eric Moen about three, four years ago and uh, kind of just kind of lit the fire under me to get going with the uh, treating bicyclists and uh, yeah it's been a blast ever since and uh, yeah I still continue to come up there and hang out with Eric any chance I can get and try to suck some knowledge out of him and uh, yeah it's been been a great experience so I just opened this clinic just roughly about five months ago and it's uh, going really well here in Portland so. Great. Uh, Matt? Yeah. Um, oh. I'm from Lexington, Kentucky and uh, I've been practicing about uh, probably 13 years and I'm a, I have a manual therapy and orthopedic-based uh, background. I actually was in the Bay Area for a while. And um, my first fitter experience was with uh, a gifted fitter and physical therapist, Curtis Cramblett at Revolution um, Rehab. And so, anyway, he, he's the one that lit the fire for me. And, um, you know, I don't uh, treat primarily cyclists. It's primarily kind of cycling injuries I treat, but more of a general uh, outpatient uh, population. Great. All right. Um, so if everyone's ready, we're going to jump into it here. Um, so PT should be on the front lines of doing bicycle fits given their training, yet there seems to be a void when it comes to finding a PT who uh, specializes in bike fit. Do you all find that this is the case, and do you think that there's a potential area for growth within the field? Well, I'll start out uh, from the Seattle as aspect. I think... Um, when I first started doing bike fit, it was me and one other person, and it was just when the medical bike fit, we'll say, uh, concept was just getting going. Uh, since then, it seems like there's a glut of physical therapists in the Seattle area who are uh, who offer bike fit uh, as part of their practice and uh, patient client management. I see that as a as a good thing and a, a, we'll, we'll say a, a proof positive that it's a valid uh, part of managing the bicyclist. When we talk about managing the bicyclist, it's if you, you really have to look at them with their equipment, uh, it's akin to if, you're, if you have a client who's a runner, you don't just treat them 
by uh, you don't just treat them by uh, just looking at flexibility and strength. You have to look at their their style of gait. And for a cyclist, looking at um, looking at them and their style of gait on their bicycle in the office is a uh, is is what has to happen in order for you to effectively manage uh, the bicycling client. I think uh, in the Bay Area, I, I know Curtis Cramblett, he does an excellent job. I, it's interesting, a lot of people may advertise it, but no one's really pushing forward with it. And um, it seems like if you get a good person out there who um, does a good job and gets some good word of mouth going, that people will seek them out, and, and that's what I see here. There's probably, I, I would I would guess there's probably more in Seattle trying to make their way. It seems like everybody out here is trying to do a lot of everything. And I, I do believe uh, physical therapy will do the bike fits. Yeah, I would just like to add, um, you know, as far as, I think it seems to be fairly um, area specific. I mean, here in Portland, um, it's not really pushed in the medical community surprisingly <laughs> enough here in Portland. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of great bike shops and a lot of great people doing bike fitting out there, but I think as far as bringing the concept of the physical therapist or even the chiropractor, there's kind of a handful of people really important that kind of try to take, uh, take the, that by the reins. And with that said, I think, you know, when we start to get into bike fitting, we're starting to think about um, the people that are out riding. I mean, out here, I mean, outside of my clinic, uh, we have an area where we see 1,700 bicycle trips a day. And uh, not all those are people out riding centuries or out riding really long rides. And so I think what we're trying to do is try to bring bike fit kind of just to the everyday cyclist and, and try to uh, make that more that they would be seeking from that, uh, from the physical therapist or from your healthcare provider, just like you would, like Eric said, with a running injury, uh, with a throwing injury, we're just, it's just another extension of, of, of treating the individual, with what, what troubles them, so. Yeah, and, I, and I'll also add from where I'm at that uh, because of technology, because of training programs, that in the past five years, I've seen fitting in the bike shops become much better, and um, so that's decreased some of the, the, the uh, kind of more obvious problems that I've seen with saddle height and um, really a more kind of apparent problem. But, you know, where the bike shops may and the other fitters probably fall short is really where we can step in by dealing with the body. And many times it's a problem with the body that needs to be addressed that, that no one else can. That We're just in such a unique position uh, to help the cyclists with. I, I would... Uh... I'd like to add just a couple other things. You, you, that that brings up a, a point of differentiation when we talk about bike fitters. Right now, there's you know it's a huge part of the in uh, a, a huge part of the bike industry is this added service, not just in the sale of bicycles, but in the fitting process. And it and you know it is the right thing to get people fit well on their bicycles because you know if you have a person who's riding on their bike and they're happy and they're comfortable they'll continue to ride on their bike they'll continue to buy bicycle equipment they'll continue to buy new bicycles so it really is a valid part of the industry and, and really where the physical therapist hits the hits that sweet spot or hits their spot within that within that service offering is that we really do own that body of knowledge not own it but I mean we we strongly are strongly trained in musculoskeletal issues and that's something that the bike industry really, bike industry really struggles with they know that it's a significant part of bike fitting but they don't have the training to best understand that that part of the world so I think if if um, as far as physical therapists and their role in bike fitting um, you know, an obvious place that they can start are are with regards to overuse injuries, pain syndromes uh, associated with bikes and bike fit and bike training. Anyone else on that one? Um, so, oops, sorry. Oh, real quick, um, Eric brought up a good point, and what I have found personally in my practice is. Everybody falls into one of two categories, and I call it the 90-10 category. Everybody comes in, and 90% of the problem is the bike fit, and 10% of the problem is that actual person, or it's 90% the person, the musculoskeletal condition that needs to be dealt with, and I do maybe you know 10% of the bike fit. So, and 
a lot of the, you know, the bike fit people, they're in and out real quick. And that, that's why I like to partner up and find a good bike shop. Like Eric said, there are a lot of good bike fits out there. Um, and uh, I like to partner up with the good bike shops that know how to do the bike fits. And then when people start having issues, then they come see me. <clears throat> Great. Yeah, actually, that was one of our questions. Um, what extent do you think most neck and low back pain occurs um, in cyclists is because of poor bike fit? So it sounds like uh, most of the injuries that people sustain is because of poor bike fit? Well, I, I see both sides of that example, that 90-10. I almost just flip a coin every time and say, you know, is it going to be the bike fit or the posture? And almost you see them come in with the bike and you all – I pretty much almost know, oh, we're dealing with a person issue here and uh, not a bike issue, or, man, this bike really looks out of whack, you know, it's probably going to be a bike fit issue. Most of the time, you're correct. When we talk about um, injuries uh, on the bike, I really like to classify them into either chronic injuries or pain syndromes. And pain syndromes are essentially those things where a cyclist may not be tolerating a certain sustained posture, so you're essentially getting a strain. So when we take a look at most common bicycle injuries or pain syndromes sustained on the bike, you're really looking at knee pain. The, the, primary, the primary buckets, if you will, are anterior knee pains and low back pain. And really with regards to our low back pain, the prime drivers of those injuries are poor positions on the bicycle uh, or poor physical preparation for bicycling or a combination of those two. And so there really are some very simple things that, that one can do to make themselves better positioned on their bike such that they can tolerate that torque inductance to the drivetrain of the bicycle such that they don't have their uh, strains through the back or upper extremity or lower extremity. All right, great. Um, so while we're talking about uh, specific injuries, are you all seeing an increase in uh, acetabular tears among patients? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question because we really weren't too familiar uh, with femoral acetabular tears until roughly five to seven years ago. But, you know, people have had these tears for for as long as we've, we've been in existence, but we've just started to recognize him now. So, you know, to answer the question, is there more of an incidence in cyclists, I, I think we can probably say we're just starting to recognize him more, and it's similar uh, to how we're recognizing them more in other sports and, uh, you know, soccer players and volleyball players, etc. So, you know, I primarily deal with road cyclists, and for these other guys that deal with a cyclocross athlete, perhaps it's a different a different mechanism. I'm curious to hear you guys, your thoughts on the cyclocross athlete in relation to, to acetabular um, tears. Well, that's um, a couple of thoughts on that. One of the things that, uh, obviously, the, the hip has become more popularized over the last five to ten years. So, yeah, we have, we have improved identification processes of hip pathology. But even back probably 10 or 15 years ago, I've had, had a client, uh, it's actually a Portland, Portland athlete, who had horrible hip problems uh, from assuming, uh, we'll say, irregular positions uh, from the road bike. This was a person who was racing uh, quite a bit and uh, assumed really aggressive forward positions on the bike coupled with really narrow positions of feet on pedals and really that puts you up into a closed pack position in the hip so you do run the risk of damaging the hip or putting chronic uh, stress and strain to the hip joint and so he was a person who uh, who had uh, early arthroscopic procedure it traveled back to Pennsylvania to to, uh, to uh, have uh, there was a couple guys back there doing uh, 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 forget the guy, he's up at uh, Stedman's Hawkins Clinic now, but he was an early arthroscopic hip guy, and so uh, there's definitely, in cycling, there's definitely potential for hip damage. With regards to the cyclocross athlete, 
you have to kind of look at that group. I mean, in the U.S., cyclocross is really, at least in the Northwest, continues to gain popularity. So we see more and more people there, and and people who are really new to the sport. When we look at the when we look at the cyclocross athlete, the average participant is your road cyclist, who we'll say is poorly prepared to jump on and off of a bike and run with a bike. Um, when you're taking a look at a person who's poorly prepared to do the rigors of cyclocross, which involves slippery wet conditions, um, jumping over barriers, running up hills, sure, the, the, you increase your risk of damaging a hip. And then again, back to the point of, well, we've got much better ways of identifying hip pathology and there's much more, we'll say, uh, lesser impact procedures that, that can deal with hip pathology or identified hip pathology. So as far as cyclocross, I mean, one, the numbers of cyclocross athletes are up and the number of participants who are poorly prepared to do cyclocross are up. So anything can happen. My rule of thumb on a bike is um, don't get off the bike, so that excludes cyclocross and triathlon. <laughs> you just stick with a mountain biking and the road bike. The only way you're going to hurt your hip is to do a Floyd Landis. So. Yeah, well, that's... That's absolutely true. You know, that's when we talk about hip pathology in the cycling population, that's clearly um, one of the, the problem areas is when you, when you have the old slip and fall to the side and we take a look at, uh, we primarily hit on the left side, when you look at that and you, know, you have all sorts of uh, probable uh, trochanteric fractures, we've had acetabular fractures, uh, femoral neck fractures. So. Those are those are the more common, we'll say, more common hip pathologies than say labral tears, but it, it certainly can happen. And you know, the other component with endurance athletes, uh, to a certain degree, is you ask runners what they do to train, and they say, "I run." And you ask cyclists what they do to train, and they say, "I cycle." And really, we, we are in a perfect position to provide them with other types of activities and other exercises that can really supplement their, their biking activities off the bike or, or, or even in the pool, for example. Terrific. Um, so we're talking about pretty extreme endurance athletes there or people that are taking part in a new sport. What about patterns that you see between recreational cyclists that maybe just commute to work uh, versus road cyclists who are training for a triathlon or putting in a lot of mileage? Do you see common patterns between the two groups? I think, uh, yeah, I think any time that you're starting to put, uh, you know, more time on the bike, you're getting greater chance of, you know, because bicycling is a repetitive type of uh, activity, you know, the more time and the more, uh, you know, the amount of training they're putting in is, you know, puts them much, much more at risk for more injury. Um, we have people out here that are, that are basically uh, bike commuters that ride still 20 miles one way to work and uh, they come in and say, well, I, I'm not a very serious cyclist, but, you know, they, they ride 20 miles a, a day. So, um, you know, anytime people start to increase their mileage and start to do take their body, you know, way past their usual limits, you have greater chance of, of injury. And that basically happens when people go from commuting into uh, especially triathlons, different things where they're really exerting a lot of force or being put into positions where they require a lot more flexibility, a lot more uh, power to the pedal. So, yeah. Well, when, when you look at uh, what literature says about uh, comparisons to recreation of recreational cyclists to competitive cyclists, what you typically see is that the, the competitive cyclists are differentiated by um, acute injuries such as associated with falling off their bikes and uh, prevalence of chronic injuries whereas your recreational cyclists have more of the pain syndrome types of injuries like back strains, knee pain, saddle area, regard, uh, saddle area related pains, uh, numbness in hands and feet. And so really they're less catastrophic, if you will, compared to the, the faster athletes. When you look at studies that, that um, when you look at studies of triathletes, I mean, you mentioned uh, triathletes, Alex. One of the things that um, one of the things that triathletes have that it's a little different is the older triathlete 
tends to fall and break things more frequently than uh, <laughs> than the younger triathlete. And really, the the faster younger triathletes we're seeing mostly uh, abrasion, contusion sorts of things where they're falling and sliding, uh, falling and sliding. And clearly, when you're going at a higher speed, uh, and you maybe get above or beyond your, your bike handling capabilities, certainly there's that risk of slip and fall. The other thing, maybe one other thing to mention uh, to bring the mountain bikers into play, there's studies that have looked at uh, mountain bike injuries as well, uh, and if you're to sustain the high, higher frequency of sustaining an injury with mountain biking is typically an over-the-bar type of uh, incident. So. Your front wheel hits something, your bike stops, you don't, you go flying. Uh, shoulder injuries, hand and wrist injuries uh, can be common on uh, mountain biking. And this one study that looked at this uh, tendency in, in particular found that uh, women were more frequently affected than men for this population that was studied. Very interesting. Um, that actually segues into a question that we had actually talking about uh, gender differences. Um, this might be a bit of a wild card, but um, discuss the role of central fatigue and gender effect in the sport of cycling in light of a current research journal um, from the European Journal of Applied Physiology. Did anyone read that one? Any chance? Yeah, you know, uh, honestly, I didn't, but I kind of go with the rule of thumb that women are far smarter than men with regards to uh, with regards to most everything. So, um, typically, you see men beating themselves into a <laughs> beating themselves up on the bike quite a bit, and women are far smarter about it uh, than the men are. But what did the article say, Alex? Can you summarize it? Did you? Um, no, I'm sorry. I'm just reading a. Uh... I'm reading a submitted question. I have not read it myself. Um, but it sounds like central fatigue might be more behavioral than based on gender. Well, men are always looking for excuses, right? So <laughs> it's just psychosocial. Yeah. All right. Um, well, we have another sort of wild card while we're on the topic. Um, if anyone has any experience with whole body vibration, we had a question. Uh, do you think that whole body vibration will become more commonly used modality to offset the decreased bone density we see in competitive cyclists in light of emerging research? Well, you know that that that's an interesting question because when you when you do look at um, populations studied, you're looking at people who are what I call chronic cyclists, or they're pretty exclusively just doing cycling and and one of the things that we do know is that that's a benefit but also a problem with cycling is uh, a less it's a lesser weight bearing uh, activity and it's kind of a, a philosophical question because really if if you're going to be a world champion in anything you have your specificity of training has to be so great that it oftentimes puts you at an unhealthy state uh, in other ways. And really, the advantage of, if you want to go up a hill fast, for example, you get as light as possible. And, by the way, our cycling happens, uh, our cycling may have something to do with that. But the other thing that, that I mean, you, you can't just look at the lack of weight bearing as, as evidence or a stimulus for uh, an osteopenic change in bone, you also have to look at possible hormonal contributions to uh, bone loss. And we know that our, our cyclists or our endurance athletes who are training at a very high level uh, are, are at risk for, um, like our women are at risk for uh, amenorrhea and our men are at risk for hypogonadotrophia. And those are certainly things that can lead to bone loss as well. And so really when we look at overall bone health in cycling, you have to look at the origins of why a person's losing bone in the first place. So if it's because they're just riding themselves into like a skeleton, then clearly there's potential hormonal uh, problems with regards to their bone. When we look at... Um, 
if, if it's truly just a lack of weight bearing and these athletes have been riding their bike for 50 years and have done nothing else, well, first and foremost, that's going to make them boring people. Uh, second of all, uh, you know, really as responsible stewards of our body, you really look at ways of trying to maintain the overall health of your body. And we know that overall health of body is not met by just riding a bike as far as your exercise. And so we, there's ways of increasing bone density through exercise. I don't think literature has really shown enough conclusive data that vibration alone or vibration plates alone is a substantial uh, bone density stimulus. So when we talk about the whole concepts of, of vibration as a modality for increasing bone density, you know, I maybe but I think it's more, uh, if you've got one, you know, it's certainly a modality you can experiment with. But you have to look at, a thera you know, what therapeutic dose, how much vibration does a person have to sustain in order to have bone uh, density stimulation? And is a person sitting? Are they standing? You know, it's, I, I don't know. I, I don't think it's a, I think there's better ways of doing it than vibration plate. Yeah, was that was that question submitted by someone who sells vibration plates? Perhaps uh, no, I'm kidding, uh, <laughs> but no, probably. Uh, yeah, like I said, I mean, the whole point of stimulating bone density. I don't know if you would just rely on purely vibration. I mean, just jump up and down and put some stress through your bones. And I think that's, like I said, as a physical therapist, that's kind of what our jobs are to do. So yeah, I don't know. All right, um, I think that one maybe a little before its time. Um, all right, uh, moving on. Um, another question submitted. Uh, discuss the role of upper quadrant in cyclists, since people often forget that cycling is a closed chain activity for the upper body. This is actually uh, one of my favorite topics. I challenge anybody, anybody watching this, and I've challenged every client I've ever seen, to give me another sport or activity. Well, we'll stick with sport. Give me another sport on the face of the earth where you actually weight bear through your upper extremities for the duration of the activity. And so my my approach and my belief with just about every cyclist that comes in young and old is we're going to have to do more upper quadrant, more upper core training with them. And so the, uh, the wrists, the elbows, the necks, the shoulders, the mid back, even the low back pain people actually start on the upper quarter and actually work my way down with the training. So. Actually, I like that question a lot because I, I think we over, excuse me, we underestimate the value of the upper quarter, which means the public doesn't estimate it at all, to be honest. And I think also, more specifically, when you're talking about exercise for uh, the upper quarter, we, we, we use the word exercise, and instantly as physical therapists, we think strength, but really, we can't ignore the whole component of coordination with the, ex with the upper extremity, too, because you know, with your hands on the handlebars, it, it's, it's one of your points of contact on an unstable uh, machine. So really working on uh, coordination uh, through both hands, uh, shoulders and arms, um, is really an important component of, of any kind of rehab program. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we could even even tie in the, the concept of even bike fit with this as well because, um, like I said, if we're trying to get uh, the person fit on the bicycle, if we're trying to think about how much weight is on the arms versus on the seat, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, I think the goal is always, they had said, like 70% on the saddle, 30% on the hands. But, um, yeah, like I said, I mean, I, I, I definitely agree that we shouldn't be neglecting the upper body at all or the core. And I, and I don't even know if there's really ever been any great studies out there really examining muscle activation patterns of the upper body um, during cycling. And I, I think, you know, it seems like most of the studies have always been focused on uh, the legs. And it would be great to, like I said, dive in and start to really start to dissect out the upper body and how much the core plays a role and, and things of that nature. So, so Well, gonna... with the, um, the, the great Greg LeMond and apparently the only American of record to win the Tour de France now. Um, Ouch. I know. Um, uh, with Greg LeMond, though, you know... No one ever won it at this point, Eric. Let's, let's go. There's the no winners on this. There's no winners of the Tour de France. Uh, so, but anyway, Greg LeMond, who clearly has experience uh, riding a bike, he, he said 
he's described it in the past that that as a road cyclist, and I will just say, leave it as a road cyclist. As a road cyclist, you want to have these huge, gymongous, powerful legs, and then the upper body that resembles that of a concentration camp victim. So they really the the upper body traditionally has been downplayed significantly in the role of road cycling. But when we talk about the upper extremity uh, for our road cycling, y you have to think of it in two different ways. The, the arms are really an important um, shock absorber uh, on the bicycle. So absorbing load, uh, uh, taking in bumps, uh, keeping the upper body quiet. It's also a force transference point. So when we go to torque, uh, create torque to the drivetrain, the upper quadrant creates an effective force couple through the trunk as a base of support in order for us to push hard to the pedal. So really we talk about things like the biceps which are very important in helping stabilize that base of support. Then secondarily, um, they also help with posturing. So they're helping hold up the torso as you're positioning yourself on the bike for you know however long your ride is. Then, I mean, even from there, I mean, a lot of what's thought about or traditionally thought about upper extremity in cycling is just really applied to the road cyclist, or road cyclists are really the only people who are talking about upper extremity. When we start talking about different disciplines within cycling, that, you know, actually the role of the upper extremity significantly improve or increases, such as our mountain biking or cyclocross, I mean, you got to have you got to have pretty strong arms to one attenuate all the vibration and load from the front end, and secondarily, lifting the bike uh, while well, either on the bike or off the bike over barricades, up hills, etc. So, um, track sprinters, uh, you better believe they've got a, a, a really strong gun show, so to speak, through the upper extremities. Because when you think about it, going from zero to forty miles an hour in say 200 to 400 meters, I mean, you have to be able to really create a strong opposition through the handlebars to create that amount of torque down through the pedals to get going that fast. So, it, uh, over, oftentimes overlooked, but, you know, really, uh, really pretty darn important. Any other thoughts on uh, that? All right, we're going to move it on. Um, so to what extent do you address cleat position in someone who had a calf strain, for example? Well, with regards to calf strain, I mean, you have to look at the origins of why they have the calf strain. But, but people who come into cycling uh, who, who have had calf strain issues um, are essentially in two boats. Uh, one of them... Uh, one of them is that perhaps the, the cleat position is too far forward on the shoe. So we're creating an ineffective leverage of uh, foot to pedal. Uh, or we're lengthening that lever uh, and perhaps putting too much force through an elongated lever. Uh, secondarily, people who strain calves uh, will sometimes have their saddles uh, of excessive height. And so really you have to evaluate is a cleat positional change something that uh, is the only thing you look at not the only thing but it's definitely a part of it and really for a calf strain it's either the cleats too far forward uh, or usually the saddles too high and those are the two primary origins of our calf strain of bicycling so when you're talking about calf strain for, for bike fit um, I actually really appreciate Eric's comments, but you also have to look at the proximal hip strength as well, the hamstring strength. Um, I've seen people with calf pain and calf strain, and they're trying to generate too much force through their calf because they don't have uh, the glute, they don't have the hammy strength that they need, and, they're, and they're, it's a compensation pattern. So the, uh, the, the fix for them really wasn't the bike fit, but once again, looking at their body and, and saying, well, why is this hamstring, why is this glute weak, and Furthermore, let's go to, to, to strengthen them up to restore your pedal stroke. Sure, yeah. You know, the other thing that um, yeah, definitely pedaling is another consideration piece. The, the two things that I mentioned 
uh, were probably the most common, uh, but definitely pedaling skills, uh, such as if you're a big pedal masher, uh, which really, in a sense, are people who are pedal mashers uh, don't necessarily know they have anything other than their quadriceps and their gluteus maximus in pedaling. And so you will end up overstressing, overstraining every pedal stroke, which can then create calf strain. But it's usually usually our cleats are too far forward on on uh, the most of the calf strains. And you know, I would even add, you know, like you'd mentioned, pedaling skills. You know, sometimes we even see people that want to that pedal almost uh, with their heel down below the pedal, even uh, trying to fight that. I mean, you're going to typically generate a little bit more Achilles tendon uh, type symptoms from that. But that's another thing that we will see is just inadequate pedaling skills and just not, you know, people think that that's the correct way to be pedaling on the pedals there, so. Yeah, definitely those saddle too low scenarios and coupled with low cadence mm -hmm. uh, can, can do that as well, sure. You know, all this takes us back to Eric's first comment of seeing, you know, we see the runner on the treadmill. You got to put all through, this is funny because all this calf strain thing I've seen it in the hip, I've seen it in the pedal stroke, and I've seen it in cleat position, and you won't, you won't see it unless you see that person on the bike. Yeah. And otherwise, you're, you're sp no pun intended, but you're spinning your wheels and you're wasting their time. So you got to put that person on the bike. And uh, I know Eric has a whole clinic built around a space for bike fit, and the best thing we ever got was a clinic where I could uh, commit a space to a bike trainer so that I knew right away. Even if someone showed up unannounced with their bike, okay, let's put it up, you know. So that, that's nice. you got to see them on the bike. Yeah, definitely. All right. Yeah, it definitely seems like we are definitely uh, coming back to bike fit a lot. And um, on that topic, um, another question submitted. Are any of you using uh, retool technology or any other fit technology in your clinic? Um, I have a, I have a re retool in my office. Um, as part uh, as part of what we offer here, I think uh, retool is certainly a, a very popular topic these days. And and what retool will tell you is that it is simply a tool. It doesn't tell you how to fit people on their bikes per se. Um, and really, the the thing that I I would encourage people to do prior to considering something like retool is it really you really have to understand the basics first so in a very simplistic way you have to walk before you run so learning how to look at bicyclists through basic assessment skills really is a critical piece first and foremost and what retool is actually um, in having chatted with them uh, just this last September um, they're starting to, within their program, uh, within their education programs, are are coming back and, and demonstrating some of the fit concepts uh, with goniometry, uh, which is, uh, you know, what physical therapists do first and foremost. And so, um, when we look at the use of a retool, if you are if you are considering the use of a retool, one of the things that you really have to do, and I, I would strongly suggest this is take the retool courses because you have to know the ins and outs and subtleties of how to use that equipment. And there is a learning curve to that. Um, what I've seen is I've seen independent bike shops who are using this equipment, um, again, just being a tool, it allows them to make as many bad decisions as it is uh, used to make good decisions. And so really your fit paradigms have to be sound and solid. You have to have good capabilities of understanding musculoskeletal and bicycle skill contributors to the overall problem. And I think the, the best use for the retool is when you're starting to look at weird asymmetries in, uh, in your bicycle pedaling condition. Um, it's great for looking at um, to see if your interventions, if your bike fit inter interventions have actually substantially impacted the cyclist. That being said, 
we as physical therapists know that whenever we make a change or whenever we have a person who needs to work on their hamstring flexibility, their strength, their coordination, there's really an accommodation period. So if we're just looking at instantaneous change and adaptation, if you will, to a certain position on a bike, really we're not giving the client adequate time to understand if a person's going to fit a, a or tolerate a bike fit intervention. So if you're using the retool just as a quick little, boy, is this right? Well, it might be not right because the person hasn't warmed up or you know, they're, they're, they're too stretched out. And so you can see that their, their um, positional things uh, may affect their pedaling style. The other interesting thing, and this is with use of retool, is that um, I've had clients who have had horrible looking pedaling skills and it, it may have just been, uh, it, it may, you know, people may have interpreted that as like, oh, well, let's change their bike fit to see if uh, we can make their wiggle go away in their knee. Well, in this case, we just had a person work on their pedaling skills, and lo and behold, their, their, their motion, irregular, apparent irregular motion issues went away. It, for a very simple, uh, for a very simple process of just working on, pedaling skills. And really, at the end of the day, or maybe at the beginning of the day, we should have really good pedaling capabilities first and foremost. Uh, and that's, that's every bit as much as part of the bike fit process and evaluation of the cyclist as you can. So the question is, um, do I use it a lot? I, I, I honestly don't use the retool a lot because it doesn't fit so well into patient visit evaluation time. The retool usually takes a, a lot longer uh, uh, evaluation period for equipment setup and teardown. Um, the other thing is if I do use it, it's usually on a second visit rather than a first visit. Uh, that way I will have gone through the evaluation and, and have made some basic adaptive changes to a person's fit of their bicycle uh, and then the follow-up visit will be with the use of retool to see how they've adapted or to see if there's any other fine tuning that we may uh, do on the position of their bike. I want to hear Matt and uh, Kevin's input on this too because I, th I think this equipment stuff is a huge because I get people call and think the only way we can do it is with the with the actual equipment so I want to hear Matt and Kevin's opinions on this stuff too. Uh, I'll, I'll, chime, I'll chime in then for sure. Um, you know I think I think out of the, the, it seems like the more tools, the more toys you have, sometimes the more it turns off your brain a little bit. Um, and that's kind of seems to be what, what I tend to see with people is that they go through, and I remember I actually had a bike fit just last week where I saw somebody and he came in and said, well, I went to this so-and-so bike shop and you know, I'm pedaling and, man, the whole time my knee was hurting and the guy's not even looking at me. He's just looking at the computer screen and he says, he says well, well is, and he said, is this right? And, and the guy just doesn't even look at the cyclist. He said, no, no, this looks perfect. I'm looking at this right now, and the guy's like, this doesn't feel right. And he's like, no, no, this is good, man, this is good. And sure enough, you know, a week later, he's coming to see me. But, um, you know, like I said, we, as Eric said, it is a tool, and if you know how to use the tools correctly, it can probably assist you. But if you're basing your entire knowledge of bike fit off of what a computer and what your certain pinpoint uh, spots are, uh, yeah, I think you're setting yourself up for failure because you're not utilizing any clinical judgment. It is only going to relay what you are putting into it. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of my opinion for sure. Yeah. You know, I, I don't have much experience with Retool, and I can't comment. Uh, I can't really add to, to that conversation. Um, but one piece of technology uh, that I find helpful really in relation to the pedal stroke is a CompuTrainer. And it's... It, just looking at what each foot's generating, I, I think that's a helpful tool uh, for me. Yeah, but back to the retool, the, um, I have an example of a client uh, I was working with, and they, they had gone through, uh, similar to what uh, Kevin had experienced, they'd gone through a uh, bike shop retool uh, use, and, and a person was just chasing the numbers on the screen and making some what I'll say are inappropriate interventions based on this person's uh, musculoskeletal tolerances or intolerances. So, so they were making the changes just to make the numbers look better on the screen. Uh, and if you do that, you really fall into a trap. So, I mean, bottom line, this person ended up seeing me 
uh, I didn't use retool. Uh, we just did some very, uh, very basic changes. We'll, we'll call them low fruit changes to really make the bike uh, better tolerated by this person's musculoskeletal system and, and taught them exercises. They were inappropriately prepared for cycling to start with. And so sometimes the retool, if you're just following the numbers, uh, will make you put the saddle a little too high or maybe make you make it look like you need to put some sort of uh, varus or valgus canting or wedging uh, in shoes where in actuality if you're doing the right thing from a bike fit paradigm you know it it's very you know it's very in ways it's very simple to get people much closer to the ballpark without to start out with rather than needing uh, fancy fancy we'll call it fancy equipment I mean retool to get into retool uh, just the equipment if you're buying new is right around fourteen thousand dollars and that doesn't include uh, travel and education costs to uh, learn how to use the equipment and then there's your training time to figure out you know you get enough runs if you will or iterations to try to get uh, good um, good mastery of its use and so there is time related to it um, is it useful? Absolutely. I think there's great use for retool, um, but I think again, you really want to master your basic bike fit or basic bike fit skills and tools first and foremost, and understand the musculoskeletal contributions to bicycling in general uh, before you advance to a retool. All right, terrific. Um, so um, we have about 10 minutes left, so um, I'll just go ahead and open it up, get away from the submitted questions, and uh, let everyone have some last words or address any topics that they feel have not been covered. Kevin, Matt, you got something. Come on. <laughs> well, I, I think, uh, yeah, basically, I would, I'll just reiterate um, kind of what I had said, and I think as physical therapists, we need to start kind of positioning ourselves and letting the public know um, that perhaps we are the ones to be looking for uh, when doing bike fit, when taking care of cycling injury. Um, I would also be one to advocate that bike fit is not just for your racers. It is not just for uh, your people out going to be doing endurance riding is I think everyone that is everyday cyclists could probably benefit from having a better bike fit and improving efficiency and being more comfortable on the bike. Um, you know, I would say a story about, you know, we had a little old lady that wanted to just ride her bike to the farmer's market one day and, you know, so if, if little old lady rides to her bike to the farmer's market and her knee hurts when she rides her bike, well, the next time it comes to going to the farmer's market, she's, what's she going to do? She's going to take her car instead. And so if we can kind of make adaptations to promote more bicycling, uh, the amount of commuters, the amount of city infrastructure is going up uh, drastically and all, all throughout the United States about creating better bike ways that, you know, if we can position ourselves as saying that, you know, whenever you get a bicycle, just simple fitting from a qualified PT could be really of great benefit for you. So, you know, that would, that would be my, my plea is just is to try to make bike fit not intimidating to your average cyclist or your folks that just want to ride a bike every single day because that's their mode of transportation as well. Yeah, well put. I mean, that, that's really, um, it's bike fit for the people, so to speak. A lot of times uh, when we talk about bike fit processes, um, oftentimes that gets pushed over, oh, you know, I don't race. How's that ever going to help me? Well, it's going to help you ride your bike uh, a lot more because you're going to feel better. The other thing about bike fit is you really need to have this whole idea that um, in in servicing a person well with regards to bike fit processes, that bike has to be able to handle safely. You got to be able to grab the brakes well, operate the brakes well, have a good weight balance over the bicycle. So there is a there is a whole process with regards to bike fit that helps enable comfort, economy, and as well safe handling of that bike because at the end of the day if the person can't operate their bike well or the bike gets this weird shimmy coming down a hill that's not going to be very healthy for the the individual cyclist a couple other little points that um, that are out there the American Physical Therapy Association had uh, the physical therapy month uh, uh, I helped them do put together some materials uh, 
in a program called Bike Fit and Bike Ride. So if you're a, an American Physical Therapy Association uh, member, if you just do a simple uh, site search for bike, you'll come up with some nice materials uh, that are very basic materials that talk about uh, concepts of bike fit, of, of bike postures, of muscles involved. So that's that's something that's out there. The other thing about treating the bicyclist is that this is a potential source, uh, a potential cash source for your cl uh, for your clinics. And there are people who are willing to pay fee for service uh, for bike fitting services. And so when you talk about uncertainty of the uh, healthcare market. Uh, and third-party payers. If you get people who are willing to pay cash, you know that's that's a great source of income for you. And Kevin touched on the whole idea that the whole idea that um, there is increasing bike utilization, and, and cities are starting to put in infrastructure for cyclists, which is really increasing bicyclists. You see this in New York City. Portland's gone absolutely crazy. Portland, Oregon's gone absolutely crazy with their bike infrastructure. Seattle's starting to come along with it, and they're doing some really nice things. But anytime people put in bike infrastructure with regards to pa uh, pathways, uh, um, bicycle-specific routes, you see an increase in bicyclists. We were just in New York City last month, and, it, and I hadn't been there for about five years, and it, it was really amazing to see the increased number of bicyclists. So as we see this this wave of infrastructure improving across the United States and people utilizing the bikes more, you will see a larger patient population or patient pool who are struggling with health and bicycling. And that's where people like us really have a unique opportunity to help this population. Yeah, well put, Eric. I think we, have, we do have a very unique opportunity and it kind of hinges on the other kind of obvious part is that the public realizes that we're in that role and you know we really need to promote ourselves as physical therapists as being the ones that understand these issues but furthermore the ones that can can help uh, these patients um, the ride bikes feel better absolutely and so I think one of the things that um, that a few years I guess it was almost six five or six years ago for the physical therapy month that was one of the things we were trying to do is trying to increase one, public awareness, uh, and two, increase the physical therapist awareness that, hey, you know, physical therapists have an important part in treating the cyclist. And really, you, you look at it as like there's bike mechanics and then there's body mechanics with regards to our bicycling uh, uh, group. And really, uh, we're, we're definitely the, the bicycle uh, the, or the body mechanics. You know, I think when a person a physical therapist is starting to work with people or with bicyclists, there's really kind of a uh, almost a, a slight disconnect because really when you work with bicyclists, you do, if you start doing bike fit, you have to, you have to one, know all the bike parts and pieces, and two, you have to make mechanical adjustments to that person's bicycle uh, if you're doing bike fit. And that it's that's really sometimes a disconnect uh, for the physical therapist. So anything that they can do to increase their mechanical savviness uh, and to understand parts and pieces that are available uh, for the bicyclist such that they can make for a more accommodative, more, more appropriate uh, fit uh, on a person's bicycle, more power to, more power to you. And there's definitely um, resources that are out there that, out there that are industry-based and then there's also places like uh, what I do in uh, continuing education with regards to uh, bikept.com where we we take people through the process of one telling them what you know who are the people what are the processes of, of taking care of the bicyclists well uh, and then giving them the, the con some of the competencies to go back to their office and then actually jump in and, and uh, actually jump in and get treating get their hands greasy uh, on the bikes and, and get people well situated so that they can, our clients can get out there and get back on their bikes. I mean, that's that's the other thing is a happy client, well taken care of client is an incredible word of mouth and incredible buzz that helps build your notoriety in practice. So it's a matter of having those successive success successive success stories. Uh, that the word of mouth in the bicycling community, as much as the bicycling community likes to think they're big, it's a small group and they're really um, people talk and so if you're doing a great job people will talk and 
and fill your offices. Terrific. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your knowledge with the community. Um, thank you. You can watch this episode uh, after this at Therapedia.com and more episodes of PTTV. Um, if you want to get in touch with our panelists here or learn more about them, you can see their profiles on the site. And to keep the conversation going, you can go on Twitter and use hashtag PTTV7 to ask more questions. Um, yeah, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was great. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.